Family background was mentioned. Let's start him off. He's born in Stratford on Avon. And he's born in 1564, towards the end of April. We don't know the date of his birth exactly. We keep usually 23rd of April for the birthday because it's the day on which he died, and it's on St. George's Day. But uh, all we know is he was baptized, he was christened in the church at Stratford on the 26th of April. Now, at that time, children were always baptized within a very few days of birth, so late April would do a nice thing. Stratford. About half, about the middle of England, not of Britain, because not of Scotland up there, but about the middle of England is Stratford on Avon, on the river, as the name suggests. There are several rivers called Avon in England, because it's simply the Celtic word, the pre Saxon word for a river, Avon. And now, it was, was a small market town, a very typical English institution, somewhere between the great cities like London, Norwich, York. Bristol those days, uh, and the villages. It was an urban centre, a small urban centre, for the um, villages and farms around it. The sort of place with a weekly market where the people would come in from the country with their produce to sell it in the market and get the stuff they needed made. So it was a place that supported very largely craftsmen of various sorts. Now I wonder, does anybody know Midsummer Night's Dream? Yes. At all, yeah. Okay. Remember the, the mechanicals there, the, the laborers who are doing a play? Okay. Do you remember the, what trades they were, any of them? Uh, the carpenter, a joiner, isn't it? Tailor, tinker, a weaver, a bellows vendor. But exactly, you see, the sort of people. In Stratford, they weren't, those aren't ancient Athenians, I recall. They're Stratford workmen. You come in with your load of eggs to the market, you've got a hole in the kettle, you take it to the tinker, uh, or you take it. Uh, perhaps your bellows for a burning fire need mending, so you'll find out Francis Root, the bellows vendor, and so on. So that's all place it was. And Shakespeare's father, John Shakespeare, came from just outside Stratford, a little place called Snittlefield, which you needn't remember, and set up a business there. He worked in leather, particularly in gloves. Now, Shakespeare shows quite a remarkable, excuse me if I ingest coffee at intervals, don't you? Um, Shakespeare had a remarkable knowledge of leather in his plays and the different types of leather and things they could be used for and so on. And that was his, that was his father there. was a nice little business, not aristocratic by any means, but not a laborer either. He, he employed labor and he went on to do quite well for himself, as a father, in, in Stratford and get civic office, but eventually seems to got into debt for all the hard ways. His mother came from just outside Stratford, from a, a farm, a farming field. I don't, you're not going to Stratford, I suppose, are you? In this yes, we are. Oh, you are? Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Well, and I didn't say too much. You'll see the birthplace uh, where he was born, and if you have time, you go out to Wilmcote, to his, where his mother came from, Mary Arden. A nice Elizabethan-style farm. They kept it up beautifully there. If you have time for that, that's super. Uh, he probably went to the grammar school there, which would be a sort of high school. Um, we don't know anything. There's a lot we don't know. For the simple reason there are no records. That's why we don't know when he was born, because they didn't register births, you see. He registered births, only in the church christenings. Anyway, the, f the first real date we know after his birth was in 1582, when he was 18. And he married Anne Hathaway from a neighboring village of Shottery. Now, they were married in November 1582. She was 26, he was 18. Uh, their first child, Susanna, was born the following May. Before your own conclusions. <laughs> she was obviously pregnant huh? mm. uh, when they were married. Well, that was not all that uncommon then, especially in country places. Um, well, that was the first daughter, and then he, uh, the twins were born a few years later. And there are many lost years. We honestly don't know. People have written imaginary biographies. We don't know what he was doing for a long, long time after that. But he may well have gone up a little bit north from Stratford to Lancashire, got a position in a noble house there, sort of tutor and master of revels. We don't know. But what we do know is that we find him in London in 1592. And by that time, a man called Robert Green. Green with me on the end, 
who was by then a successful writer in various genres, and was dying and writing his last testament. And he was very nasty about Shakespeare. He was very jealous of him, obviously. And he says that he is, is able to bombast a blank verse as well as any other. Player's heart wrapped in a tiger's hide, and that's a parody of Shakespeare's lines and so on. The shake scene, the only shake scene in the country. Which tells us, you see, that Shakespeare by that time was established in London as both actor and writer. The only shake scene in the country. It's player's heart and all the rest. It's a, successful enough by that time to arouse jealousy in, in another writer. Now, Two years later, we find him as a sharer in the Lord Chamberlain's men. That leads a bit of unpacking. First of all, who were the Chamberlain's men? Well, the acting companies were, by sort of legal fiction, made servants of the households of the great lords. The point was, you see, they were rogues and vagabonds, technically, under the law. They didn't belong to an established profession or anything like that. Or attached to a farm or a great house. And they were liable to get in all sorts of trouble with the law and be put in the pillory and have their, uh, the ear bored through a hot iron or a compass of an inch about to bore a hole in your ear to show you, see, that you were a rogue. <laughs> so to avoid that, some of the noble lords would say, well, these are, these are our men, technically. These are our servants. And it was nice of the noble lord because he could uh, call on their services sometimes for a play at home or to to walk into procession, swell his household. Now, the Lord Chamberlain's men were the, one of the leading companies. Chamberlain was Hunsdon, who was the uh, cousin of the Queen, great court official. And the other big company at the time was the Lord Admiral's men. That was Admiral Howard of Effingham, who'd uh, beaten off the Spaniards in 88 at the Spanish Armada. <laughs> Those days, no nonsense, fishing rights, European Union nonsense. Spaniards are coming, you know. Oof. <laughs> Don't mind me. Uh, <laughs> so, those were the two leading companies. Now, it's a little confusing in some ways of what happened because, again, the records aren't so good. The, the um, Admiral's men were formed in 1585, the Chamberlain's in 1594. Shakespeare seems to have fluctuated around a bit in those early years between the companies, um, but eventually to settle down with the, with the Chamberlain's men at the theatre. So it's called the theatre, I'll come back to that later. Well, I want to make a point about the sharer, though. Um, he was one of the leading actors in the company. The sharers were those who owned the company, took the profits, took the risks and so on, made the decisions, small company of actors. Now, Hamlet, okay? You know Hamlet, you say. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how um, the players come to Elsinore, mm -hmm. uh, do a play, and um, Hamlet wants them to put on a little play to catch the king. And he writes a little speech for them to put in. You could, uh, he says, learn a speech of 12 or a dozen words. Now, he's rather pleased with this speech, and he says to his friend Horatio, would not this buy me a share, he actually used the word fellowship, in a cry of players? Isn't this good enough to get my way into an acting company? He's joking, he's saying, Horatio says, mm, half a share. <laughs> yeah, I'm the whole one I. So, there it is, you see. So, by that time, he's 30, which is a much greater age then than now, as I expected it was shorter, but he was still young. And there he was as a um, sharer in one of the leading companies. And writing his only plays, which are mostly history plays, I don't know if you know any of the histories, later histories, do you, Henry V, Henry IV, Richard II, they are quite good. The early histories aren't very good, actually, um, by, by the later standards, but never mind. And he wrote histories and comedies, and of course, Romeo and Juliet, which you, which you all know. Now, to come on with the bit more on the theatre, are the actors, of it, they were organised. Um, do we get the concept of the guild, the trade guilds at all, uh, from the Middle Ages onwards? Broadly, if you um, 
had a craft, a goldsmith or shoemaker, whatever. You belonged to a guild, and you had to do that, because it was that sort of society. You got in awful trouble. As I said, you were a rogue and vagabond that didn't belong. And these guilds were organized broadly like this. There were the masters who owned their own business, employed servants and so on. And together, you can see where this is tending towards the theatre at the moment, they together made up the kind of governing body uh, and regulators of the guild, all the goldsmiths, the um, shoemakers, cordwainers, and the rest of it. And then they would have, they would employ journeymen. Not as you might think going on errands, journeys, but by the day. Any French scholars? Journey? <laughs> okay, well, day, day laborers, as it was. And apprentices, boys from about 14 or so, whose parents would pay an indenture to the master, and he'd take them into his house, teach them his trade. At the end of that time, they could graduate, as it were, to become um, fully qualified. And the last piece they made, say they made a very good pair of boots or a good chair, that was your masterpiece. Mm. So if you write here, this essay, say, this is a real masterpiece. Right? <laughs> That's where it comes from. Now, let's, let's apply this to the theatre. That's how the theatre get the companies were working. They had their protection from great lords. Okay. So in a company like the Chamberlains or the Admiral's men, you had the sharers, like the masters. They were the bosses. And they owned, 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 the, owned the company and took the profits and so on. There were the hired men, they were like the journeymen, hired men, they called them in the theatre, who were actors just paid for a particular performance. Some of them seemed to have been very good and famous, but they hadn't the money or the skill or a bit of influence to become sharers. And there were the boys, they were like the apprentices, boys who were taken on. One of the leading actors promised to teach them how to act, and they would act and, and, and learn eventually. So that was how the companies worked. Now, as you probably know, there were no um, women in the theatre. All the women's parts were played by boys. The Elizabethans were curious in a way. They were terribly sort of rough and sort of bawdy and everything in some ways. They had their inhibitions. They didn't mind women going to the theatre. The idea of a woman on the stage shocked them terribly. In 1620, a company of French actors came to London with women. They wouldn't listen. As soon as women came on the stage, they started hooting and whistling at them and drove them off. So it's all boys. Taking these, these wonderful parts, just think of those lovely parts thing of, of Julia. Rosalind, Fiona, uh, Beatrice, you read much ado, I think. Mm -hmm. Lovely Beatrice. And uh, the boys' parts. It must have been pretty good. There's, it's pretty certain that some of the men also, the older men, also played women's parts. Sometimes the, probably the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, for instance, um, and the more mature women like that. Yeah. And um, sometimes they had to sort of get around this a little bit. Now, Midsummer Night's Dream, we've mentioned before, they're giving out, Quincy's giving out the parts, and he wants Francis Flute, the bearer's vendor, to play Thisbe, the, the heroine. And Francis went, no, nay, let me not play a woman's part. I have a beard coming. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Tush, when you we do it in a visor. You can always put a mask on. Mm. So what about Macbeth? Do you remember the witches? Mm. Macbeth. And when they meet them, Banquo says, you should be women, but your beards do bespeak you men. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, the male actors were taking on that. And then they had to explain away that the beards were back <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, did Juliet play the role of the was Juliet played by a man? Well boy on certainly the young heroines like that would be but certainly certainly not a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, oh no doubt there were no women, you see, at all on the stage. It's sort of right off women from the English theatre until after sixteen sixty, after the restoration. Uh, the only the nurse might have been an adult then, but but uh, Juliet and all those other lovely young heroines were played by boys. boys. Magnificent, they must have been. So, you see, things like that, and little lines in Macbeth. He, he was a working actor. He wasn't sitting in Ivory Tower or right on campus or something. He had to deal with the realities 